The elections are passed at Westminster. The Queen's speech is ready to go. But will the battle north of the border be the big decider of what happens to Britain now? Here in Edinburgh, Nicola Sturgeon back at her desk dealing with the pandemic but ready to do battle with Boris Johnson over a new referendum on independence. Can Westminster block the democratic will of the Scottish Parliament? We'll be examining what routes could lead to that big vote. Also tonight, as violence flares in Jerusalem with reports of 300 injured in a day, we speak to the ambassadors for both the Palestinian and the Israeli people. Hello, good evening. The Queen's speech is traditionally the start of new beginnings, a brand new legislative agenda, a fresh parliamentary year. And there's much to please the government from the latest election results. But there is a constitutional headache pressing on its political temples even before that can begin. What happens now in Scotland? Nicola Sturgeon was one seat short of a majority, the mandate that triggered the referendum last time around. This time, she can argue her coalition in favour of independence is even bigger. Can a government in England really stop her in her tracks? Tonight we have the latest on the legal position with Kirsty and Lewis in Scotland. But first we go to Nick Watt, who's been picking up the latest on what we should expect in the Queen's speech itself. Nick, where, where do you think the focus will be? Well, there will, be, there will be that pomp and ceremony tomorrow, uh, Emily. Uh, obviously rather toned down because of COVID. And yet, as you say, the future of the UK, yes, it's decided in Westminster, but it is also decided in the new power centres across the UK. So in the Queen's speech tomorrow, the, the Prime Minister really sees this as a chance after a year focused on COVID and the pandemic response for him really to reach out and deliver for the Red Wall Coalition that was at the heart of his general election success. So there's going to be a big focus on skills. There is going to be a big focus on policing and immigration, appealing to those socially conservative voters. The Tories hope there'll be a dividing line with Labour on that. But also we may well see, we're in fact going to see changes to the way in which elections are held, general elections are held in this country. So we know that Downing Street is going to take back the power to call elections because they're going to repeal the Fixed Term Parliament Act. But they're also planning to bolster the Prime Minister's power there by looking, they think, at shortening the period in which an election is called. So they're haunted by the memory of 2017. Theresa May called an election. She had to wait seven weeks until the election was held. It all went to pieces. They're hoping at shortening that to sort of five to four weeks. That's a really significant Prime Ministerial power there and a lot of speculation at Westminster that the Prime Minister is eyeing up 2023 for a general election. That would be three and a half years after the last one and a year earlier if he were not to do anything with the Fixed Term Parliament Act. Nick, that other electoral issue um, we're expecting is voter ID. Why are they bringing that in now? Yes, so compulsory voter ID will be in the Queen's speech. Interesting, in 2004, Boris Johnson was no fan of Tony Blair's uh, ideas of um, ID cards. He talked that he would physically eat it in the presence of what emanation of the state has demanded that I produce it. Now, Downing Street is saying this is not an ID card. It's like the Northern Ireland system where you are just asked to produce a form of photo ID in order to vote. It could be a driving licence, it could be a passport. What critics say is it's generally lower income people who are less likely to have that ID and also point that there was only one conviction for in-person fraud at the 2019 general election. Nick, thanks very much indeed. Well, over now to Kirsty in Edinburgh. Kirsty. Nicola Sturgeon, Boris Johnson. Two leaders is the zenith of their political power. The question of the union will define their political careers and ultimately could well destroy one of them. Right now, the First Minister says her focus over the next 12 months is the recovery for the pandemic. Boris Johnson, the Minister for the Union, remember, after the polls closed, displayed what Gordon Brown today decried as muscular unionism and called Nicola Sturgeon and Mark Drayford, the Welsh First Minister, to a union summit. Well, this moment is ultimately about democracy. And although people talk about the Constitution being a reserved matter, can Boris Johnson deny the will of the Scottish Parliament? And will he? 
Well, I'll be discussing that in a moment with the deputy leader of the SNP, Keith Brown, the Conservative MSP, Murdo Fraser, and the director of the Edinburgh Centre for Constitutional Law, Stephen Turner. But first, here's Lewis Goodall. He's been out in the capital as Nicola Sturgeon kicks off her fourth term. Edinburgh was a very curious place today. A period of calm after the storm. But it's an illusion. Both sides are thinking, preparing, strategizing for what comes next, for the battle they know is coming. Perhaps the most significant clash between London and Edinburgh, Westminster and Holyrood since before the Act of Union itself. The people of Scotland have voted to give pro-independence parties a majority in the Scottish Parliament. So in no way, can a referendum be described as just a demand of me or of the SNP? It is a commitment made to the people by a clear majority of the MSPs who have been elected. The new Scottish Parliament looks a lot like the old Scottish Parliament. The SNP up by a seat, maintaining their remarkable hegemony. They won 47.7% of the constituency vote. No Westminster party has won an equivalent in the UK since 1966. As a result, they came one short of securing a majority with 64 seats. But with the Greens, there's a clear majority for independence, bigger than there was before. But even though there was a leader generally thought to be less impressive than the last, the Scottish Tories remained on 31 seats. Labour went back a bit, but more or less the same too. Nationalists and Unionists got about 50% of the vote each. It is a country divided and frozen in that division. Nonetheless, that majority for another referendum in Holyrood is there. And the most important question that Sturgeon must now determine is when she will decide to use it. They certainly won't want to be having any referendum quickly because they won't be able to campaign in the way that they would like to. We obviously saw that through the, the election campaign we've just had. That, you know, it was very restrictive for the political parties. So for the independence movement, they want to be out in the streets. They want to be leafleting. They want to have those stalls everywhere and do those marches. And, you know, they won't be able to do that at the moment. So they'll, they'll wait till uh, COVID is over to the extent that that will become a possibility again. But also, I think... Um, they have, they have to develop the plan for independence, you know, and Nicola Sturgeon, through that campaign, was very clear that they don't have the answers to many of the questions that proved the problems for them in 2014. The route map to a new plebiscite is also unclear. Boris Johnson has repeated his insistence that he will not grant another referendum. If he refuses to budge, Sturgeon's options are limited. If Boris Johnson continues to say no, what does she do? How does she achieve it? Because she's not going to have a wildcat referendum, that's become very clear. So what is she going to do? How can she obtain one? We'll need to see what, what, what happens next. She will legislate for one. The Scottish Parliament will vote to have one. Um, that's the democratic choice. It's then up to the United Kingdom government or others to oppose that and take it through the court system. Um, if it ends up with the UK Supreme Court saying that it's a matter for the UK government to legislate in the Constitution, then we will see what happens next. Democracy needs to win. Britain needs to be a country in which consent and democracy wins, rather than one in which legal force is used to confound what people want. That can't, can't stand. It won't be sustainable. In the meantime, unionism considers its own response, attempting, perhaps incredibly, to suggest it wanted the politics out of this most political of questions to be removed. The priority at the moment is not court cases, it's not independence legislation, it is recovery from the pandemic. It is a very great honour to be Prime Minister of Scotland. They must know they'll have to tread carefully, that like Margaret Thatcher's refusal to budge on devolution in the 1980s, Westminster intransigence might fuel rather than satiate Scottish separatism. How can it be right that the British Conservative Party can hold a referendum on Brexit on the basis of 37% of the vote, but the Scottish National Party can't have a referendum on independence when in the Parliament they have over 50% of the vote and over 50% of the seats? in terms of having a pro-independence majority between the two parties. How can that be right? Well, I think the, the major issue here is that there was a generation between our last vote on Europe. Uh, there hasn't been uh, between the vote in 2014. And look, if we want to make it a generational vote, we say it's every 20 years, maybe that's something we need to look at. But what we can't do is trap Scotland in the insecurity and the uncertainty of constantly breaking out of the United Kingdom. In other words, both sides are making a bet that the tale they're telling about legitimacy and who has it will win out, because that's what's going to matter. 
In some ways, this obsession over the question of whether or not the SNP had won a majority misses the point. For a start, it's not as if Boris Johnson would have acquiesced and granted a referendum had they won one. What matters much more in terms of what happens now isn't the numbers in the Parliament, but the numbers in the polls, about the extent to which Scots come to actively demand another referendum, not simply vote for one. In other words, which side can best effectively channel and corral public opinion about this debate. Because it seems that the only way that it's likely that Boris Johnson is going to grant another referendum is if the public opinion in Scotland, if the public clamour in Scotland makes one irresistible. A contest then to come in the parliaments, in the courts of law, and most of all, in the court of public opinion. A clash of personal and political wills, and a question to be settled now at the heart of our new devolved constitution. Who? Where? has the last word. Lewis Goodall will join me now is Professor Stephen Tierney, the director of the Edinburgh Centre for Constitutional Law. You were also the parliamentary advisor in the 2014 referendum and you're the House of Lords advisor on the Constitutional Committee. So you're steeped in this. What is the most likely scenario? Well, it seems clear that the Scottish Government will bring forward a referendum bill. They've got one ready to go. Um, the question then is the legality of that bill. There are certain steps they would have to get over initially. Um, first of all, it would have to be signed off by the go Scottish Government's lawyers themselves. The Lord as Advocate. Lo the Lord Advocate as lawful. And then the presiding officer would also have to admit the bill to the Parliament as lawful. So that's quite interesting because the presiding officer isn't necessarily of the governing party. Correct. The, the presiding officer is, like the Speaker in the House of Commons, um, a, a neutral referee. Could be a Green. It could be. We, we, we don't know. So that, that person will be elected early. In the, in the and, and what legal challenges could then be brought? Just say it doesn't get past that point. Yes. Well, when the bill is admitted, if it's admitted, then it's open to the UK government through their law officers, such as the Advocate General, to challenge. If the UK government stands back and the, the bill passes and becomes an act, it's still open to a private citizen to challenge. So I think it's almost inevitable that this bill will end up in the Supreme Court. But can you really justify ruling by the force of law and not by consent? Because is that a very good look for democracy? Well, one argument is that law, by definition, is passed by consent. The Scotland Act was, was passed on the basis of a referendum itself, which was overwhelmingly approved. So that's, that's the, the first point. I think also we need to look at the, the law as it stands, which is that the union is a reserved matter. There's some dispute as to whether or not this bill would clash with the union yeah. and would itself um, be uh, incompetent. But I think it's likely that the court would find that to be the case. But is there an argument to say, whether you uh, support independence, whether you're conservative, liberal, democrat, green, whatever, that people in Scotland feel aggrieved that something that passes the majority of the Scottish Parliament can be not only set aside but denied? by the powers at Westminster? I think what's been unleashed by the election are these big political questions. And frankly, those will be the questions that the political parties yeah. will be engaging with. Um, I can only really talk about the, the issue as a matter of law. And it seems to me that the framework of the legal question is, is one that probably has to be settled first before those political questions are addressed. Um, but could there be a way to have a different kind of referendum? You, an advisory referendum, for example. I think the, gov the Scottish government's argument will be that this is within competence um, because it's not in intending to directly break up the union. It would simply be asking the, the people of Scotland for their opinion. Then it would come down to the courts to decide whether um, such a referendum is also a reserve matter because it affects the union. It seems to me from recent cases that, that the courts would find even a purportedly advisory referendum um, to, to relate directly to the union and therefore to be incompetent. We don't know that for sure, but it seems to me that that's the more likely scenario. But briefly, do you think this is more likely to be denied than not, a referendum? I think the Supreme Court would more likely than not, based on a decision in the Court of Session two weeks ago, um, I think it's more likely than not. Thank you very much. We'll be joined now by uh, Keith Brown, the Deputy Leader of the SNP. Keith Brown, um, I wonder um, what you made of what Stephen Tierney has said, that the most likely scenario is that it is denied. 
Uh, well, I don't agree with that, but I'm not a legal expert like Stephen Tierney. I do think that the last word will be had by the people, and the idea that uh, legal processes can be used to subvert or veto the democratic decision of the Scottish people is as bad as the uh, antics that we saw from Donald Trump. Uh, there are questions as to how this is done and done properly, and it will be done properly. But as we're seeing over the last few days since the election result, we're seeing change in language from the UK government. Uh, Michael Gove even said that he wouldn't challenge this uh, in the courts in any event. And I think, unlike some of the Scottish Tories that you hear from uh, later on in the programme, I think there's a realisation that this has been voted for, the mandate is there, and this referendum is going to happen. Well, let, let me just put, go through a couple of things with you that Stephen Tierney said. In the first instance, you put the bill forward and the Lord Advocate has to have his say. Uh, it is a he just now. Uh, then the presiding officer has to have their say. Now, it's perfectly possible the presiding officer would stop it at that case. It's perfectly possible the, the Lord Advocate of Scotland would stop it as well. Well, I don't think, knowing the Scottish Government, that they would want to bring forward a bill that wasn't going to have that kind of uh, consent from the Lord Advocate and likely to have the consent of the presiding officer as well. I mean, the people in the Scottish Government have done this before. It's also worth saying, though, that the distinction between advisory and binding uh, referendums, if that's the antonym for advisory, it's pretty murky to me because the Brexit referendum was essentially an advisory referendum. It did not become a fact of law until the UK government subsequently legislated for it. So uh, there are questions to be answered here. Of course there are. But the basic fact is we have to, in a democracy, respect what people have voted for. And they voted in their majority for people that support the idea of Scotland having a choice in its future. And that is what yeah. will happen. But if... But if there is any uh, overt signs of prevarication and delay, what about the Kenny McCaskill line? Is you've got to move forward, you've got to move forward more quickly. And you know his his um, co-member of Alba, um, uh, Alex Salmon, said that uh, Nicola Sturgeon is behaving like the grand old Duchess, leading them up, leading them back down again. He says Peel wanted to move much more quickly. Are you being too canny? Uh, no, I think the First Minister made it, I can't speak for the Alapa party, but the First Minister made it absolutely clear that the first priority was going to be dealing with the pandemic. Uh, and it's extremely important. We've seen today, for example, in Murray, in part of Scotland, that we've seen an uptick uh, again, and there is a, an incidence of uh, coronavirus, which is causing real concern. And that may, it may happen in future. We have the new variant switching coming. So I think every political leader uh, seems to be agreed that we have to deal with this pandemic first. And the First Minister was meeting with her advisors tonight. She'll be making a public so, statement on the coronavirus tomorrow. It's important we do that first. Um, what about this way around, that you negotiate the terms of independence before the referendum? Isn't that actually quite an interesting idea then? Because then people know exactly what they're voting for when they're voting for the terms of independence. No, I think you take the people's... Um, the people have the argument first. The people have the discussion, the debate, and they make the decision. And then I think you take it forward from there. There was no negotiating the terms of Brexit before they had the Brexit referendum. Uh, and none of the previous uh, referendums was that the case. So I think it's really important that we start from the basic principle of what people say that they want, what they vote for. Of course it's right. There have to be detailed arguments put before the people for them to make that decision. I understand that point. But it's the people that we should start and finish with in, in a democracy as to what decisions are taken. What will be the most difficult thing? Will it be currency, deficit or border? Well, I think all of these issues, we have a policy on currency. We've had that for some time uh, just now. The deficit that we have currently is comparable to the UK. It's comparable to many countries of the world that have struggled with, uh, with the pandemic. The UK is currently over £2 trillion in debt. It has around a £330 billion uh, current deficit. Everybody has struggled with this pandemic. There's no question about that. But the idea that Scotland is not a wealthy, prosperous or able enough country to look after its own affairs is a nonsense. Sorry, I didn't catch that. And the border? Well, of course, the border and in Northern Ireland. And the border, when you look because... at what's been happening in Northern Ireland, what about the border yeah. issue? Uh, well, the border in, in Northern Ireland is a mess because of Boris Johnson. He moved it to the Irish Sea. I mean, if you don't tell people straight up front beforehand and then do something different afterwards, you're going to have real problems. And that's really an issue in Northern Ireland. The border that we have currently between England and Scotland, of course, will be unaffected in terms of people travelling back and forward. The common travel area will stay. Also, services can continue to operate. Now, I remember dozens of Tory MPs saying it was possible to get a technological fix for the border in Ireland. That kind of disappeared over 
time. But it's simply the case it will come down to a negotiation. And if both governments are willing to have the best possible accommodation, there's no reason why that shouldn't happen. Thank you very much indeed. I'm joined now by uh, Murdo Fraser, the Scottish Conservative spokesperson for finance. Uh, Murdo Fraser, uh, first of all, is this a straight out no from uh, the Westminster government? Well, I think what we heard from Michael Gove at the weekend uh, is that now is not the time for uh, another divisive independence referendum. Now is the time for the Scottish government to concentrate on COVID recovery, on rebuilding our economy, helping create jobs, sorting out the NHS and sorting out some of the issues in education. So there's a lot for the Scottish government to be getting on with. And now is not the time for another referendum. And I think we need to be very clear uh, and you wouldn't well, have got this from listening to Keith Interesting, Brown. Murdo Fraser. Interesting, Murdo Fraser. Sorry. 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 I think we need to be very it, clear. Just say interesting, we, Murdo we Fraser, because, from... of course, in the Queen's speech, we're going to end the fixed-term parliament. We're going to end the fixed-term parliament so Boris Johnson can maybe hold a, 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 a general election in 2023, which would also probably be pretty disruptive. So is it, is it uh, an outright no, or is it a not now, not in the next 18 months, but maybe in two years? What is it? Well, I think, I think what the UK government is saying now is not the time. So um, it's not for me to say when the right, might, the right time might be. Interestingly enough, if you look at the polling in Scotland, it would suggest that even amongst people who support another independence referendum, they don't support that within the next three to four years. It's a longer time scale than that. So even supporters of independence are not keen on another independence referendum soon. But there's an important point I want to make to, to pick up what Keith Brown said. In the election on Thursday, the majority of people who cast their votes for the constituencies voted for parties who were opposed to an independence referendum, not parties who were in support. So we've had a very clear vote that shows that, albeit by a very small margin, most people in Scotland do not want another independence very referendum small at this point. A, t a tiny margin. A tiny margin. Look at where it was ahead of the Brexit referendum. You know, let's just be quite clear. It was a tiny margin. Do you? I just on the. You're a lawyer, so therefore, um, do you think you can rule without consent, ruling only by a law, not a partnership? How is that a proper union? Well, let, let, let's put this in context because it's actually very important. Back back in 2014, we had a legally binding referendum that was agreed between the UK government and the Scottish government. That was on the back of a, a SNP victory in the 2011 uh, election in Scotland, where they got an overall majority of seats. And they haven't done that on this occasion. It was also on the back of a situation where the entire got Scottish the Parliament, the entire Scottish Parliament voted in support of that referendum taking place. There was a national consensus that that question that had never been put to the Scottish people in 300 years should be put. And uh, the whole country engaged in that debate, a debate that we were told would be a once in a generation event. And we reached a clear conclusion that the people of Scotland wanted to remain as part of the United Kingdom. Now, we are in a hugely different scenario now because we are only just seven years on from that last vote that we were told was a once in a generation vote. There is no consensus uh, around reholding uh, that referendum. As we saw in the vote last week, half the population at least don't think this is the right time to revisit this 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 uh, question. So unlike 2014, when, this, when the situation was we have a consensus about proceeding, now the country is split right down the middle and nothing could be more divisive than the SNP for their selfish reasons trying to proceed with another referendum. Murdo Fraser, thank you and thank you all for joining us. Emily. Now more than 300 Palestinians have been injured. 21 Israeli police also hurt in another day of violent clashes at the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. Rubber bullets, tear gas, stun grenades were fired by police. Some landed inside the mosque itself. Today Israel said it had killed three Hamas militants in airstrikes. Hamas sources say 20 people were killed, including children, in the attacks. This evening, they fired rockets from Gaza that reached Jerusalem, although it's not thought anyone was hurt. The clashes at the mosque began on Friday after protests broke out at the start of Ramadan over police restrictions at a popular meeting spot and amid tensions over the threatened eviction of dozens of Palestinians from their homes in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood of East Jerusalem, the occupied territories. Ali McBull reports on a decades-old conflict that has recently produced the worst violence in Jerusalem in years.
It is the worst violence Jerusalem had seen for years. By the day's end, it would lead to bloodshed, not here, but in the Gaza Strip, and with a sense that more is to come. Tension had been expected, but not on this scale. Ahead of a march by Israeli nationalists to celebrate the country's capture of East Jerusalem in 1967, hundreds of Palestinians had been in the Al-Aqsa Mosque, ready to oppose them. Police stormed the area, and these scenes, shocking to so many, are what followed. In what is a sensitive time, during the final days of the Islamic holy month of Ramadan, Israeli hardliners had gathered outside the walls of Jerusalem's old city and had planned to march through its Muslim quarter, close to the holy compound. The Israeli authorities had refused to reroute or stop the march, and instead police used rubber bullets and sound bombs and water cannon against Palestinians who planned to oppose the march, many of whom threw rocks. For all the violence Jerusalem has seen over the decades, clashes inside this sanctuary are rare. How on earth any member of the Muslim community or indeed anybody who has the faintest feeling for religion can actually watch this kind of sacrilege taking place at a very, very special site, very sacred site, um, and, and have these vandals um, uh, running riot and, 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 and doing these terrible things, it, it really is beyond belief. Palestinian militants in Gaza decided what they should do is fire several rockets into Israel, setting off the warning sirens. But Israel responded swiftly with airstrikes on the Gaza Strip. Children are among the dead. But in his denunciation of what happened today, Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab didn't specifically mention the hundreds injured by Israeli police or the lives lost in Gaza, and instead said, the UK condemns the firing of rockets at Jerusalem and locations within Israel. The ongoing violence in Jerusalem and Gaza must stop. We need an immediate de-escalation on all sides and end to targeting of civilian populations. The authorities did eventually decide it was right to reroute the Israeli nationalist march in Jerusalem, but by then a deadly sequence of events had already been set off. Israel, though, blames the Palestinians who'd gathered to confront the marchers. If you have um, violent individuals from Hamas going into a mosque and using it to attack Israelis, you got to bring that to an end. And I don't care where you are, if you're in uh, St. Saint Peter's Cathedral or if you're in uh, uh, you know, some other religious site, violence has to be brought to an end. People from the outside will see an antagonistic event, a, a march that goes through the Muslim quarter of, uh, of the old city, and will see that as the reason why tensions were so high. I, I know that the, the march of Israelis with their national flag is something that has occurred for many years now. And I don't see that as some new factor that's been poured onto the situation that has created the problem. By night, Israelis celebrated as, for a short time, a fire burned at Al-Aqsa. Few expect this to be an end to this surge in violence. That was Aline McBool. We're going to get a diplomatic response from each side tonight. We have invited representatives of the Palestinian and Israeli people here into the studio. They won't be debating head to head and they are separated by some way for social distancing. So joining me first is Hussam Zomlot, the Palestinian ambassador to the UK. In a moment, we'll speak to Zippy Hotaveli, the Israeli ambassador. Uh, Hussam Zomlot, to you first of all, and Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, words today. He said, Hamas has crossed red lines. Israel will respond with force. What are you expecting that he will do and what will you do? 
Well, we've been at this for a long time. Uh, this is the sheer propaganda that we always hear, Emily. This isn't about Hamas. This is about Israel. Israel provokes. Israel commits every crime you can imagine. Israel injures more than 300 worshippers, peaceful worshippers, this morning in Al-Aqsa Mosque. Israel uh, uh, evicts people of their homes, continues with its sheer violations of the very basic rights of people, and then they try to blame the react rather than the act. Uh, uh, this must stop, and we must really visit the root causes of all this, and the root cause of all this is Israel's insistence on the very denial of people's basic rights. Tonight, as we speak, Emily, people are demonstrating in Palestine all over, including uh, cities inside okay. the green light in 48 Palestine, in Yaffa, in Haifa, in Nazareth. Why do you think people are demonstrating? They're fed up. They're fed up of their rights being denied. They're fed up of being pushed away. They're fed up of their Let's homes being down, taken then, away. Sir. Let's break that down bit by bit if we can. Um, you see it very clearly. The Israelis think that Hamas are a radical terror group and that Palestinian officials use these holy times to incite violence. Was Hamas right to respond with rocket fire? This isn't about Hamas. Hamas was not involved. There were tens of they thousands. Were when they fired rockets. Hamas did not decide to evict people from their homes inside the occupied city of Jerusalem. East Jerusalem is occupied, not according to my law only, but according to your law, according to the UK position, according to the United Nations. An occupation has to be temporary, and it has to respect the rules that govern occupation. Israel has made mockery of these uh, rules, particularly the issue of population transfers, ethnic cleansing, uh, 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 apartheid. I'm sure you have read the Human Rights Report. Those people have researched Israeli policies so over the last two years. Ask the esp experts, we not will. Netanyahu. We'll Nathan Netanyahu is question. flaming of the settlements, but let's just try and understand this. Because Dory Gold, the former Israeli ambassador to the UN, has told us it was pre-planned by Hamas, the march had nothing to do with it, you wanted to make Israel look bad. Do you condemn the rocket attacks by Hamas? I condemn and I, I condemn Israeli aggression. I mourn for the 20 people who were murdered in Gaza only tonight. Nine of them are children. I am so sad to see the hundreds of my people but you know, being... you so I'm not asking being, about Israeli no, aggression. No, no, I will no, do no, that in a moment. No, 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 I am I'm asking you about I, I, Hamas's I am, aggression I am, tonight. I am not aware of any Israeli who has been killed. And you ask me a question about violence and condemnation, who should be condemned, Emily? Who should be condemned? Did you see the images of the nine children being dissipated in Gaza tonight? Who should be condemned? And then the UK foreign secretary is quick to condemn Hamas and never to condemn the Israeli atrocities on a daily basis. We are sick and tired of the double standards. Okay. And we have to call it right this who, time. Who, who's call a spade a is spade. It, is it the Western uh, governments? Is it? You heard the statement from Dominic Raab today. He condemned the firing of rockets. What is your response to the UK government? Always the story begins when Palestinian reaction happens as if it started with Hamas. Look at your question. Your question is about Hamas, rockets, rockets. But that's it, because I'm talking to you. No, 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 Emily, no, Emily, no, Emily, no, Emily. I have done, I have done man, many interviews. It starts with the Palestinian reaction, with the symptom of the illness. It never visits the illness. The illness is that this state, Israel, the occupying state, has been um, uh, applying draconian measures against our people in every sense, depriving them the right to move, the right to own their property, the right to work, the right to uh, vote in, in a, in a free elections, including in East Jerusalem, oh. every right you can imagine, and not only, by, by the way, inside the occupied territories, but even inside Israel itself. There is a Knesset law that has deprived our people inside Israel their basic rights of having self-determination. This whole system has been built endemic in it is the racism, endemic in it is the vulgar ultra-nationalism. Ultra that's why you get people trying to defend their dignity. And that's why, if you see the images, don't listen to me. Look at the footage. People were praying. And by the way, put aside the Aqsa Mosque, one, one sentence. Put aside the Aqsa Mosque. Only last week, it was the Holy Fire, okay. Easter, and the Israeli authorities deprived, prevented I'm, Palestinian Christians you're not debating, from, I'm going from, to put from, you... from praying. So okay. this isn't about Muslims. This, okay. isn't about, this is about Palestinians. This is about Israel insisting that we are second class, not even citizens. Okay. We have no rights. We are ought to be brutalized with silence. And when we act with dignity, when we resist this, the whole thing becomes about our resistance and our struggle. And I understand very much those underlying issues. Let me ask you specifically about the Al Aqsa Mosque, because that's not something that you will debate tonight for obvious reasons. Israeli police say they believe it was being used as a military stronghold. That was why 
they started sending in their stun grenades. What is your response to that? It's nonsense. It's nonsense. My response to that is ask the Red Cross. Uh, uh, ask all the international observers there. People were going in the holiest of months, that is Ramadan, in the holiest night of Ramadan, Layl al Qadr, they were there to pray. If you look at the images, the Israeli soldiers stormed Al Aqsa Mosque while they were praying, while they were kneeling and started uh, uh, throwing all the uh, 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 gas and, uh, you know, uh, stunt gr grenades and yeah. what have you, brutalizing people. Look at the numbers. Look at the hundreds who have been injured. And therefore, this whole propaganda should not work. Israel is deliberately trying to flare the, the situation, okay. especially politicians, right-wing extreme politicians, to dodge criminal charges that is Netanyahu facing Pers and to feed the populism in Israel right now and the right-wing extremists. Thank you very much indeed. Well, the Israeli ambassador is Sipi Hotoveli, and she joins us now. And you've been listening into that. We have 300 injured Palestinians tonight. According to the Hamas Health Ministry, we have 20 dead, including nine children. How ashamed are you of your government tonight? I'm ashamed of the fact that you're not presenting the right picture. The right picture is, as you try to say to the Palestinian representative, that Israel was under attack today. Our capital city was fired with rockets. And as a matter of fact, the Israeli parliament, I think for the first time in history, was evacuated for the first time. Think about it. We're five minutes away from Westminster. Think how would you feel if London was under rocket attack? And would you sit silently and not respond in order to protect your people? You have. I believe not. The military And this is power, why Dominic Raab, this power, is why Dominic the Raab. The political power, the diplomatic your leverage. Your it secretary said in a very few words. To be responsible. I would like to, to repeat what Dominic Krab said today. He said very clearly that he condemns the fact that rockets were fired on Israel from Hamas. Yes. This is a total provocation of a terror organization. This terror organization doesn't care about settlements. This terror organization cares only about one thing. He wants to replace the state of Israel and to erase it from the map of the Middle East. Okay. And I would like to you say... You my question, at this Ambassador. Time, you are Israel. We know what Dominic Raab said tonight. We put it in our piece, yes, and I put it to the Palestinian ambassador, and he said he thought Western powers were not doing enough. Israel has military power, it has policing power, it has political power. You have, over the people of Gaza, complete, Gaza, complete control of their imports, their exports, their water sources, and, as you were hearing, their ability to even vote for their own democratic uh, right and leaders. So isn't it incumbent upon you to be responsible here? That doesn't mean shooting attacks that leave children dead. Well, we want to protect children. We want to protect children in both sides. In order to do that, in or, we want to protect children from both sides. And you cannot say different, because if you check Israel's record for all those years, we always protected human rights. We always protected. Why were you firing the only, into wait a, second, a mosque? You, uh, if you want, if you want me to, I want to you respond to answer that to question. You, you asked me about the children. The answer is very clear. Children in Israel were receiving rockets on their heads to their schools and their kindergartens. We had that in the past, and we had that today. And as a matter of fact, our IDF, our soldiers, are defending those children. They're not targeting children. They're targeting Hamas and targets. Mercifully, and as you know, they as you know, hurt. Hamas is using those children as human shields. And this is the reality on the ground. This is a cruel terror organization using the children and the women in Gaza Strip in order to achieve political I'm aims. I'm sorry, Ambassador. Every time I've done an interview of this nature, I'm always told that Palestinian people use their children as human shields. This is the truth. Why don't you step up ground, and recognize you know. when you are firing, children get killed? Because Why we're not we firing, firing into children. a mosque? We're not firing children. We're firing targets of a cruel terror organization, radical Islamists that are trying to kill our children. You fired into a mosque. You With fired, all the respect. You fired you stun grenades, that. rubber and bullets, that. and water cannon as people were praying. Surely you recognize recognize that as an act of aggression. So let's check the facts. The fact is 80,000 Muslims were praying and worshipping while their leadership, both the Palestinian Authority leadership and the Hamas leadership, was calling to come and commit violence. And this is the thing that made Israel to send, sold to send not soldiers, to send the police in order to protect law and order. This is our duty to our citizens. Now look, Everything today is under a video. I've been hearing those lies after lies of the Palestinian representative. Everything is under videos. You can see those youngsters. You, you can see those youngsters piling the rocks and, and throwing it to the people that are praying at you the think Western the Wall. The Mosque is being used is as a military stronghold, really. 
No, I said something different. You need to listen to my words. My words were very clear. We've seen the piles of rocks. They've been throwing those rocks on innocent people, trying to kill them, trying to hurt them. Okay. And, and we need to protect our people. You, this is our duty. This is the duty of every country that is protecting you its people. You the Palestinian ambassador representative here. And he said at the heart of this is everything that you are doing to evict people from their generational homes. There is a deep presentment at the way your government is behaving, evicting people from their homes. The EU has said these potential evictions are illegal under international humanitarian law. The UN says displacing natives could constitute a war crime under the Geneva Convention. Well, it's very simple. It's a legal decision. And our Attorney General asked, to, asked the court to postpone. This is an ongoing case of years. It didn't happen yesterday. So we're speaking about pure provocation, pure incitement of the Palestinian leadership against Israelis has and nothing to do homes. has nothing to do to no 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 this is nothing to do to the fact this is a legal issue this legal they issue don't believe that the law is helping them they don't you, believe they're you, you protected know by your you know laws. Jerusalem as much as I do I'm and sure I know, don't know this one and as you, you know do. and you know Arabs and Jews live together and you know through all those years this this day this special day of Jerusalem day we celebrate the unification of Jerusalem and under Israeli sovereignty always we had freedom of worship but look at what they're doing they're abusing the holy site and committing crimes of violence against Israelis, they against do innocent not Israelis. believe that you have their interests at heart. And last time you came onto this program, I asked you if you believed in the two-state solution, which would grant I Palestinians very sincerely. a homeland. You said you believed in peace. I believe peace, in peace. I still do. But you still can't say the words, I believe in a two-state solution. I don't believe in failed solutions. I believe in practical, pragmatic solutions. And I really think you should have asked the Palestinian representative, how come they refuse to sit and negotiate with Israel for years since Barack Obama was the American president. How come they refuse to sit and have a direct negotiation when there are friends in the Gulf are coming and making normalization the with United Israel? Is your How come they're the, the world only and even they Arab, say they're deeply concerned? They're the only Arab people that refuse to actually recognize the, the right to have a Jewish state. How come? Those are the questions. And I really think that during normalization, during the fact that the Abraham Accords were signed, we were really having this hope that things will get, will get better. And I still believe that with the right leadership, we will go there. But it takes leadership that doesn't incite and definitely doesn't send rockets on civilians. To be hold of Eli, thank you very much. And thank you for hope coming to the peace and quiet in Jerusalem, which is a city of peace. And that is all from us for this evening. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.